Hello everybody and welcome, it's me, Ghost Critic, and it's the very first comic book review video of the year. And they couldn't just let me ease in gently, could they? If you saw my Wednesday's uh, pull list video, you will see that I had 12 books that I had to pick up from my pull list. Uh, I've whittled it down to 10 because two of them I have dropped. Haven't read them yet. I'll get round to it, but no biggie. Um, and this video will have nine reviews in it. And the pick of the week will have its own separate video, which will come shortly after this one. So remember to check that one out as soon as you've watched this. And we better get on with it. Uh, I'm going to kick off with Boob Studios. It's Fiction Squad, issue four of six. Um, and I love this book. It's so fun. It's so cleverly written. We basically have um, the uh, the witches of Oz um, battling against the uh, Queen of Hearts and her sisters. And it's all fun. It's all very humorous. There's lots of funny asides. It's very clever how they portray the story. Right at the beginning, there's like a new story read by a fox for, guess what, Fox News. And they use a kind of puppet theatre as the... Um, as the way of telling what is going on. The last issue, we have the beginnings of a big battle between the two groups. Um, and this is shown through the, the puppets. And it's fun. It's very clever little way of um, not having to uh, draw a big, huge battle scene, I guess. But it's clever nonetheless. Um, there's, there's loads of madcap stuff in here. Uh, you really have to look. It's one of those books where you have to look at all the panels to check that you're not missing out on all those tiny little jokes here and there. Um, and it just, it incorporates so many of those kind of like beloved story, children's stories of old that we grew up with. And if you're a mother or a father, you're probably reading to your small children now. But it has obviously that adult flavour to it. This isn't a book I suggest reading with your children. Um, no, no, no. Um, but in all the fun, in all the entertaining elements of this, there is a really cracking good story in here. And it is a very kind of crime mystery story. Um, it does feel like someone's trying to pitch the two groups together. There's the mystery surrounding these eggs. And, um, and at the end of this, we have our detective um, literally being framed for a murder he didn't commit. Um, it's just fun fun. I love this. Uh, two more issues to go. The way that Paul Jenkins has uh, paced this is, is brilliant. I haven't felt bored at all. I haven't felt like he's stretching anything out. And um, I think with two more issues to go, it won't be rushed to the end either. So if you've not picked up Fiction Squad. I've not, I don't know, do Boom Studios collect their titles in trades like the others? I don't see a great many, but then I'm not particularly looking. But hopefully Fiction Squad will get its own trade. And for those who've missed out and just want to be fun and have some entertainment, uh, this will be a cracking book for you to try. The Woods number nine was a strange one this month. It felt like I had missed out on an issue as we um, predominantly follow uh, the children who were kidnapped really um, and taken to New London. New London being this kind of civilization that um, survivors from this planet have created to live in. Uh, we find out that um, these characters uh, and this planet itself um, has been around for many years and I'm talking hundreds of thousands of years. So, you know, it's all still very basic. It's all very um, kind of minimal uh, and kind of almost, I guess, medieval kind of um, 
civilization, but it is a civilization with people working together, uh, using what they can find and what they can eat from this planet. Um, of course, there is that kind of undercurrent that something is going on and it's not quite right. And this is another thing that kind of niggled me about this issue is the children are, are far too trusting of this, these, this new town. Um, and they almost feel a little too naive about what is going on. Um, and so that kind of irked me a little. However, the artwork in it is fantastic as always. It's all very bold and colourful and bright. Um, it's one of those books where you're wondering who is the baddie, kind of, who is the villain here, as we find out more about these black stones. We have uh, one of our kids here who has kind of been possessed, I guess, by the stones. Uh, we see a character very similar to being possessed by these stones um, and, and what happened to her and, and the kind of powers, I guess, that she has uh, and the, um, the idea that she knows how to get off this planet. Um, so it's all culminating to something. Who knows how long this issue, sorry, this title is going on for, but um, I'm in for the ride. I'm loving this kind of sci-fi kids breakfast club mix. Um, just have a go at it. There is a um, trade of the first, I think it's five or six issues already. So grab that, catch up with the singles and just have a really fun sci-fi adventure time with me. We move on to Swamp Thing and it's issue 38 with only two more issues to go of Charles Soule's run before Convergence begins. Um, another odd one. Um, we've got Swamp Thing and Abigail fighting off the machines there in full battle mode. Uh, thinking that they're getting somewhere, trying to make it to the kind of Arctic base. Um, to somehow bring this kind of machine avatars down. Uh, but this is all purely a distraction as um, Machine Queen, formerly Our Lady Weeds, um, has other ideas and her plans to reopen the green um, come to fruition here. Um, we have the Bag of Bones, Alec Holland's Bones. We have Arcane. Uh, Machine Queen all coming together to, um, it did look a bit strange, it almost looked like they were having sex but it was very quick and the child that she must have born grew up very quickly. Uh, we have the basically embodiment or it, at least the bones of Alec Holland back alive but severely mutated. Um, I guess part machine, part rot, um, given their um, their parents, I would say, Machine Queen and, and Arcane. And again, this is just merely yet another distraction for Swamp Thing to keep him occupied as they go after the head of the Serene, who has the power to... Um, to open and unlock the uh, the green that has been locked out of Earth, um, so they can get in there and destroy it. It's all very exciting. It's all very action packed. It's all a little bit busy though. Uh, it does worry me. This is a series that has done really, really well. Charles Sewell has obviously been building and building up on this, but given we know this is can is cancelled in two issues time. Is the end of this story going to be rushed um, right at the end to fit it all in? It would be a shame to see that. I want to see Charles Sewell be sent off on a huge high. He's done such a great job after Snyder. Um, I haven't been able to fault this book for a long, long time. Okay, Batman Detective Comics issue 38, or as I like to call it, the eye candy comic with schizophrenia. Uh, why? Because it is gorgeous to look at. No one can deny it. Uh, there is a beautiful style that these two creators, Manipal and Buccioletto, have done with this book. It, it's 
it's at least risen in art style and it's something that I look forward to at least looking at month to month. However, the storyline, it's a bit disparate. The storylines are all over the place and I'm not sure if I'm just being impatient and these will all converge and it will all make sense by the end of this. But this is why I didn't remember what happened in the last issue because there were so many random storylines going on. Obviously the main storyline here is um, anarchy and his uh, handing out of the masks to the population of um, Gotham. Uh, these are black masks. It's all a little bit V for Vendetta, anonymous group for me. Uh, it's not a particularly original idea, but Anarchy wants them all to wear these blank masks, decorate them as they see fit, so they can become um, what they really want to be. Uh, for me, it does. That doesn't feel a very anarchistic thing to do. Um, this is just, you know, bringing out what people um, want to be. Um, however, you know, there is going to be the elements of Gotham that are going to use this as an excuse to do all manner of bad things, which we will come to a little bit later. Um, there's a little quick interlude with the Mad Hatter. Again, there is this whole um, insistence for of Batman to um, get Mad Hatter to realise that he has killed Alice, uh, which uh, the Mad Hatter fervently denies. And it's just like, why is that there? Why is that such a big issue? How is it in the whole grand scheme of things in this particular storyline? Like I said, hopefully these all converge somewhere along the line and it will make sense. Uh, we have the kind of almost nonsensical Matches Malone cameo. Uh, Matches Malone being Bruce Wayne's Batman's kind of alter ego man on the street, um, kind of dealer, wheeler dealer type guy who um, who goes and he, he's doing it to find out about anarchy. Um, but going to the wrong person, I would have thought, as he goes to this reformed hacker um, who says, you know, he knows nothing about it. And the bit that kind of annoyed me and irritated me about this was that what was the point in him going to this young man? Because when he gets back in the car, he tells Pennyworth uh, one or whatever he's calling him now, Alfred, um, that he's had tabs on him for the last two years and knows this guy has gone straight. So surely he would know if this young man had been dealing with anarchy. It just, it was a little bit of a filler, filling up the pages. Again, as lovely as it looked, still filler. Um, and then of course we get the kind of finale, the cliffhanger, the big bank hostage scene where we have, has Batman killed a young boy or has one of the cops? It's all a bit patchwork. Hopefully when it's all gets sewn together and we get to the end of this storyline, it will make all sense. We come to our weekly look at Batman Eternal issue 40. I say weekly because I've not actually spoken about this for a couple of weeks. Um, and it's been a bit strange because I've not really been keeping up with watching videos that everyone else has been putting on over Christmas and the New Year, unfortunately. But I hear on the grapevine, people haven't been incredibly happy with the last few issues. This new storyline that's basically started, the, the, the next story arc where we have all the villains coming together. Um, but the thing is, I've been really enjoying it. I think it's uh, a good new starting point um, for when well, I mean, we're over halfway now in, in this series if we are led to believe that this is going on for some 60 issues. Um, so what do we have in this issue? We have uh, the continuation of the kind of Batman and Riddler relationship them up on some snowy mountain um, Riddler for some reason causing a huge avalanche which not only will um, 
put out um, Batman, but is actually going to threaten his own life. Um, but it, it's, it's a weird relationship that these two have, and it is slightly explored here. We've seen it elsewhere in kind of, it's hard to keep track of timelines, but you know, future stories where they've kind of teamed up their allies. Um, Riddler almost feels like he has to make Batman a better hero. Um, but and not a, not a great deal happens here. Riddler clearly knows more than he's letting on. He is he doesn't want to admit it, but he is frightened to go back to Gotham. He what whatever's going on in Gotham, whoever is behind all this, he wants nothing to do with it. He knows what's going on. He wants Batman to work it out for himself, but. He wants nothing to do with it. He's keeping well and truly out of it and does not want to go back to Gotham. Um, weird stuff that happened in here that I got a little bit confused about. The whole Vicky Vale and this little shooting incident at the Gotham Gazette. Um, who... Um, I've missed this. Uh, this went right over my head. Who is this shooter? Who is Patrick? Who is he to this whole Batman Eternal thing? Someone remind me. I'll probably kick myself when you tell me. Or maybe I'll just be scratching my head even more. Uh, but none of that made any sense to me. Why it happened. Uh, nah, I don't know. Um, but the funnest part of this story arc. And obviously particularly this uh, issue. I love it when villains all come together and try and work together because it doesn't work. The villains are by nature self-centred people and they will always have their own agenda, their own kind of end plan, um, end game. Um, and I just l always love... Uh, the relationships that occur when you get a group of um, villains together uh, and they're kind of backbiting, they're teasing each other, they're trying to one-up each other. Um, and here we have Catwoman trying to, you know, talk some sense into them as she is building her criminal underground world um, here in Gotham and she wants them to come on board but they've got lots of back toys to play with. Um, so they can just go and cause havoc. They don't need a plan. They just want to have things blow up and explode and cause mayhem throughout Gotham. And that is what they plan to do. And while they try and take Catwoman out, we clearly it's not going to happen. We know she wasn't going to be in that car, whether she showed up at the end of this issue or not. Um, I'm sorry, but I'm having a lot of fun with this story arc. Um, let's see how it goes. Matt Fraction's Odyssey issue 2 came out this month. And it is visually stunning. It just can't be denied. Christian Ward just makes every single panel, every page, every stroke. It is just fantastic there it's just dripping with psychedelic color and images and you just can't you know draw your eyes away from each page as you turn over it's a beautiful book the story is a little bit hard to uh, get into and does take maybe one or two reads to, um, to to sink in. And it probably would help to have a little bit of knowledge of um, uh, Homer's Odyssey, which this is clearly based on. However, I don't have a great deal of that. I have a brief understanding. So, you know, I've just got to dive in and make sense of what I've got here. But in this issue, we kind of... We, we see the wicked, callous nature of, of these kind of space gods. And, and then it reflected very much in, in the humans um, living their life down below, so to speak. And that's certainly the case with Odysseus and her partner, Sebex, 
who she terribly leaves behind on this planet uh, just for speaking slightly out of turn. Um, I thought that was a bit harsh, but you know, she's in a jacuzzi and she's smoking a bong by the looks of it, so she'll forget about it eventually. But I am loving this book. Um, it's it's one to indulge the eyes in, uh, just a beauty. Moving on to Birthright and it's issue four and in this one we get a little bit more development um, in the character of the mother and we kind of realise that she isn't as big a bitch as um, she first appeared. Um, as we find out she unfortunately is uh, or was in one of those kind of uh, paternal relationships where she was always the strict one. She was always the one handing out the punishments uh, while dad was the cool dad who took them out on adventures, who snuck them out for ice cream, uh, even though they'd been punished and were bad. Uh, so you kind of feel slightly sorry for the mother now uh, as she continues to kind of try and clear up the mess that the father and the two sons are leaving behind in their wake after escaping the uh, but the police um, headquarters because they're off to find the first one of the first mages that uh, grown-up Mikey has said is bad and has to be put down but we all know although they don't that Matt uh, Mikey is being controlled by a, an evil entity that he has brought from the fantasy world um, the fantasy world parts of Birthright especially in this issue I mean I do like but especially in this issue, I didn't think it was really up to much. It didn't really push kind of Mikey's journey of um, learning to become the warrior he was. Um, there, there didn't seem to be a great deal of substance there, um, bar that one of his friends may die in this kind of attack that is going on. Um, again, like I always say, Birthright is a little bit of a surprise for me. I didn't think I was going to like this as much as I am. Uh, I'm keen to um, see this confront confrontation now between um, the father and the sons and this first mage who just looks amazing. Um, Bresson and Lucas on art, st on art duties here uh, have just created the most amazing characters. Um, and just uh, filled them with just immense detail that I, I just want to look at it and go, wow. Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips' latest crime noir involves the heydays of Hollywood in the 40s. It's the fade out, it's issue four, and this issue uh, focuses a great deal on um, the celebrity lifestyle of the time and its uh, relationship with uh, the media, the paparazzi. And you kind of see how much it hasn't really changed from today. We still have these kind of marketing managers in the background um, trying to manipulate events. Um, getting them to go out with people, getting them in fights just to get that newspaper coverage because you know what, these are stars in the making or they've got a movie out and they need to sell it, they need that page space. Um, so that was quite an interesting element uh, reading the fade out for this issue. Um, anything else going on in here? Um, obviously, Charlie discovers something while at this huge gala party, um, which is introducing our new movie starlet. Uh, and he notices um, uh, a, a face in a photograph 
of one of the photographers of the time and while it's amidst all these other movie stars faces it looks out of place but he knows who it is he's seen that face somewhere before and we see this face at the scene of a house burning whose house is it burning it is that photographer's the mystery is deepening the mystery is getting more intriguing um, I love the way Sean Phillips um, evokes the this era perfectly once again he just has an eye for these details of the times he has everyone um, wearing exactly the right clothes that they should be wearing everything looks like it should be where it is in that era and it, the fun element here was you know he gave a little spattering of real movie characters within the actual story which was which was just great for a fan of of, of the the movies of the 40s so another outstanding issue of the fade out go out look for these issues because you don't want to be missing out on the fade out okay we finish off this video with dead class issue 10 not my pick of the week but it was so damn close because this was a very clever very clever issue um we pick up with marcus waking up after a night of sex and debauchery with another woman um yes he's been cheating on um is it maria with our um, Japanese assassin Seiya and while he should be just lying there enjoying the moment maybe feeling a little bit re bit of regret although still liking it um, he's got a shop to open and it opens the first half of this book with this crazy mad cap chase to get to the store to open because this is a big day there's a comic book sale he's already two hours late he feels like crap and the day pretty much ends with him making a bit of a mess in his pants. It's all very fun. It's all very um, kind of humorous. It's very kind of well paced. It's very fast. Um, and in, in some ways very silly. And then the mood immediately changes as we finally get the... Um, the the plan to um, take down our our nemesis Marcus's um, former bedmate in the uh, in the in the orphanage, and everything's going a little bit too easily. Everyone's playing their part just as they should, but once they get to the kind of hideout of our villain, there's no one there until. It's an ambush. And you have to wonder, has one of the team betrayed the rest? And is it because of Marcus? And is it because of Saya? Is it because of Maria? Because you had to go and fuck him, didn't you? Thank you all for watching. We've got to the end of our first comic book review video. But wait, don't forget, there's my pick of the week video that's going to come and be uploaded straight after this has. So check out what I thought was the best of my pull list this week. You probably worked it out already from um, my pull list video of Wednesday. But don't spoil it for anyone. Let them find out themselves. Thank you for supporting my channel as always. I'm looking forward to another great year of comics and sharing them all with you out there. If this is your first time here, hit the subscribe button. You won't miss out on any more of my videos. Give this video a big thumbs up and let me know what you thought of the books that I picked up this week. If you read them as well, did you have similar um, feelings about them? Uh, let me know in the comments section down below. Until next week, again, thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.